After his father's death in the September 11th terrorist attacks, nine-year-old Oscar discovers an envelope marked black among his father's belongings. Inside the envelope, there's a key to what appears to be a safety deposit box. From there, Oscar begins a journey across all five boroughs in New York City to find out whom the key belongs to and what it opens. That's the plot of today's Velshi Band Book Club feature, extremely loud and incredibly close. But at its core, this is a story about grief, grief of two different types. The singular, all-encompassing abandonment that only the death of a parent can create, and the shared, bewildering cataclysm that was and continues to be 9-11. Oscar is mourning the loss of his dad and the gaping hole in his city, his home. For Oscar and the United States as a whole, 9-11 meant the loss of innocence, a shattering of safety, a visceral reminder of mortality. Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close has been targeted for book bans a handful of times since its publication in 2005, most often because of its, quote, lewd or offensive material. In 2015, the book was removed from the Honors English Curriculum at Mattoon High School in Illinois for those reasons exactly. Several parents complained about a, quote, vulgar passage about midway through the book. The passage which does reference sexual acts, culminates with these two lines. I know a lot about birds and bees, but I don't know very much about the birds and the bees. Everything I do know, I had to teach myself on the Internet because I don't have to ask anyone. There's an irony to this quote. To ban extremely loud and incredibly close, or any book in order to shield high school age students from so-called inappropriate material when they're holding the internet in the palm of their hands is nothing short of absurd. Here on the Velshi Band Book Club, we've defended the literary and cultural necessity of exploring gender identity and sexuality in literature again and again and again. But that's not the argument I'm going to make today because those themes are not central to today's featured book. They're not even the secondary or tertiary themes of this book. The reality is this. Book banning has everything to do with control and nothing to do, generally speaking, with the content of the literature. Extremely loud and incredibly close is many things, among them objectively appropriate for its targeted age group of 14 and older. Thought-provoking. It's fodder for serious conversation, so let's have one. I'm thrilled to be joined by Jonathan Safran Foer, the uh, award-winning author of many books, including the New York Times bestseller, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, and today's feature, of the Velshi Band Book Club. Jonathan, it's great to have you on the show. We've been looking forward to this for some time. Thanks for being with us. It's nice to be with you again. We, we have to talk quickly because they're holding off the World Cup game until this conversation. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, and uh, let's dispense of the, of, of, uh, with, with the, the, the idea that this book is, is pulled out of curriculum uh, in some cases because of w what, what just seems to be sort of a passing reference to sexuality that, that every 14-year-old uh, would know or understand. Does that surprise you that, that someone misses everything you're trying to do in this book and focuses on a, on a passage that's not central to your theme? I mean, to be honest, when I heard that the book was banned, I couldn't, I, 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 I genuinely couldn't imagine why. Right. Um, extremely vulgar, besides being probably the nicest thing anybody said about me in the last year or so, um, is a ridiculous overstatement for um, what's in this book, um, especially given uh, the context as you highlighted of, of the internet and the culture that we live in now. Um, you know, is the notion that not all literature is appropriate for not all readers uh, true? I think that is true. I think that um, publishing houses curate, bookstores curate, parents curate. Um, my most recent novel probably could be fairly described as uh, extremely vulgar, and I wouldn't have it on my kid's shelf yet, and at a certain point, I would allow them to read it. So I think there's a danger in oversimplifying this conversation. Um, what is necessary is that it be a conversation. Right. That we have informed people coming from the right places, um, with the best intentions, um, curating on behalf of uh, young people. And what we have instead are uh, activist groups, you know, going over the heads of librarians who are American heroes and who are, um, you know, trained to have a good eye for what is going to help expand the minds um, and expand the hearts, by the way, of young readers.
Yeah, what we hear from you is what we hear from all of our authors, that uh, when there are books that deal with uh, critical subject matter, it's not appropriate for everybody at all times, but unfortunately 9-11 was not something that, you know, we would have liked to have curated that out of our lives too, but we can't, it happened, uh, and, and, and people died. And one of the most uh, famous and perhaps controversial of the unusual elements in the book, I don't want to give it away to people who haven't uh, read it, but it comes at the end of the book. It's a 14-page backward flip book with a photo of a man jumping from one of the towers, towers, and because it's backward, the reader sees the man floating up toward the top of the building. Why, why, why did you include that? Um, well, it's a, a moment of a kind of false redemption. You know, there is no, um, time only goes tick tock, it never goes talk tick. Um, but in our imaginations, um, and this is what is, you know, bittersweet about imaginations, we, we have the power to envision things differently. And at the heart of this book is this boy, Oscar, who has an, a hyperactive mm -hmm. imagination, um, which both enables him to, to some extent, transcend his environment or to seem to transcend his environment. Um, but uh, ultimately, as we all do, has to, has to confront um, reality. So, um, you know, that that image, and, and you're right, it is probably the most controversial part of the book, that series of images, those are some of the most viewed images in all of human history. September 11th was the most viewed event, the most witnessed event in human history. Um, part of what made it so traumatic, in fact, was just how strong a visual component it had. Um, unlike, you know, subway bombings that have happened since underground, um, this one was in the open air. It was a perfectly clear day, and um, there was a more or less unlimited amount of camera footage once the event had started. And so one truth of the experience is that it's something that we uh, registered with our eyes. We took it into our hearts through our eyes, and I wanted to reflect that in the book. But the notion that um, you know children haven't been exposed to those images in other contexts is as ridiculous as the notion right. that they haven't been respond they haven't been exposed to human sexuality in other contexts. Uh, you know, in the, on the twentieth anniversary last year of nine eleven, the New York Times uh, uh, book critics published an article that was entitled "Dread, War, and Ambivalence: Literature Since the Towers Fell," uh, in which they wrote, in part, writers are still metabolizing nine eleven and its aftershocks. They'll do so for decades, and I believe that to be true. Except your book, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, was published in April of 2005, four and a half years after the attacks. Um, would you, what would you do differently if, if now that more time has passed? Is there, is there something, is there a different story you'd tell, or would you tell this story a different way today? It's a really complicated question because the world has changed and I've changed. The circumstances of my life have changed. We all think about terrorism in entirely different ways. I think yep. about New York City in different ways, having lived here now for more than 20 years. Um, the point is not to create definitive versions. The point is as um, is to metabolize. That, that's what literature does. And, and frankly, that's also what the conversations about literature should be doing. We live in an incredibly problematic, scary, oftentimes tragic, oftentimes really beautiful world. And um, it is not obvious what the meaning of events are, or it's very rare that, that the meaning of events are obvious to us. Um, it's very rare that our feelings about events are unnuanced or uncomplicated or clear to us. And so we rely on being in conversation with others. Sometimes those conversations happen around a dinner table. Sometimes those conversations happen between a writer and a reader. Um, we need for our... Um, conversation about literature and what is appropriate to be uh, culturally metabolized, you know, to short circuit the process of figuring out what is contemporary, of figuring out what is appropriate for kids to talk about. It cannot be made by, uh, you know, activist groups and it can't be made by single individuals, as we're seeing now with uh, Twitter. Um, we need a broad and informed conversation that's coming from uh, a place of wanting to defend the interests of expanding minds and expanding hearts. Why'd you write this uh, book through the lens of uh, nine-year-old Oscar? Why, why choose a child? I don't know that I did choose a child. It, it sounds a little bit coy or, or a little precious, but the truth is, you know, um, the, the poet W.H. Auden said, I look at what I write so that I can see what I think. Um, right. I think there's a misunderstanding about writers that we have these ideas 
that we want to share or we have stories that we need to tell or voices that we found that are somehow burning up inside of us and need ventilation. For me, I have not a lot of anything, to be honest. I don't walk around with a really active interior monologue. I don't have characters living inside of me. Um, to be honest, I don't even have a whole lot of ideas, except for when I create a context for ideas and create a context for thoughts and feelings to not only express themselves, but to grow in the first place. And it's one of the reasons I, I really believe everybody should try writing. The world doesn't necessarily need more published novels, but the world needs a lot more writers. Um, one of the wonderful, wonderful gifts of being a writer is I have these daily contexts for trying to figure out what I'm thinking about in the first place. You know, we walk around with all sorts of ideas um, about who we are, you know, what we think we think, what we think we feel. And to have a reflection given back to you, a reflection of your own creation, can sometimes be really revelatory. And um, I have never written a book that I intended to write, and I have never not been surprised by you know the contents of my head and heart. What a, what a great way to end that. The world doesn't necessarily need more published books, but it needs more uh, writing and writers. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for, for uh, joining us today. Jonathan Safran Foer is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close.